right. Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone. Good to be here. And what a neat week it's been. We uh, had just a great little uh, get together Wednesday evening. I uh, had a nice room full over in the fellowship hall to discuss the future of our children's ministry. And, and uh, we're just praying God's wisdom and guidance as we go through this transitional period. Uh, also wanting to just remind everybody that the first week of October, October the 2nd, we're going to have one celebration service here at 11 o'clock. Uh, that's going to be uh, the Moore family's last Sunday here with us, and so we're going to make it a celebration Sunday, so we won't be going upstairs or anything. We're going to have everybody here together at 11 o'clock uh, for that one day, and then we're going to follow that with a fellowship meal and uh, just to celebrate their time and what God has done with them here. And so today, after the second service, uh, we will meet again in the fellowship hall. I know Nathan probably shared that with you, but uh, I would invite anybody who was here Wednesday night to come back. If you have any ideas or things that you've been thinking about or other questions, uh, certainly just love to have you. We're just going to have a time. We've got, uh, I fed about 600 of my closest friends in the last two or three days, so we've got plenty of barbecue and uh, pork loin and, and some things over there, and so Josh is getting that all prepared for us. And and so we're going to be able to uh, share in that time as well. So uh, we would love to have you. A great uh, men's prayer breakfast yesterday morning. Uh, we really appreciate that time. And that was a neat way to kick off the day and, and uh, certainly see that uh, come back and, and uh, just a really, a really good time. Last week we started a new series looking at uh, the book of Acts and beginning to just go back and explore uh, the foundations of the church. And, and so we're just going to be tracking through Acts for a, few, uh, for a few weeks here. If you want to read ahead, and those of you that are reading the F-260 plan, you're going to land here at some point and, and, uh, and, and be tracking through uh, several chapters in Acts. And today, as we continue in our series, last week we uh, went back to the last chapter of Luke. Uh, because Luke wrote both. Uh, he has the gospel, his gospel, and then, uh, which is a very thorough account of the life of Jesus. And then he wrote the book of Acts, which began to, uh, it's exactly what it is. It's the Acts of the Apostles and the establishment of the foundation of the church. And so all of those things meet together. And so we went back last week and, and just kind of refreshed ourselves on that final chapter of Luke and then looked at the first chapter of Acts and how those two tie together and how those, uh, those two books uh, uh, fit together in, in the early, early days of the church. This, this morning, I want to impress upon you that experience um, was not sufficient to carry the church through the ages. Uh, because last week, this is, what we, this is what we talked about. It was the fact that those witnesses had been there and experienced what happened. Those, those witnesses had been there in, in that land, and they had seen that, and, and they, had, they were testifying to that, and they were witnesses of what God had done, and the fact that Jesus had died on the cross, had been buried, and, and rose again. And that, that is the witness, that is the fact, that is, what, that is what we rely on, that is what we go with. But God knew that there would be more needed. And he told them, Jesus told them that when he, when he, when he came back, when he, when he, uh, after he rose, he was like, you just need to hang on, <laughs> okay? You just need to wait because uh, there's something coming. The Holy Spirit is coming. And that Holy Spirit is what provides the power. The Holy Spirit is what provides the God. The Holy Spirit is what provides what we need to sustain us. Because it is God with us. It is God in us. And, and so that was going to have to take place. And so the second chapter of Acts lays out the coming of the Holy Spirit, the giving of the Holy Spirit to all of those who believe. Now, something that's interesting to study is to study the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And also prior to this time. We see it throughout the Old Testament. We even see it in the New Testament. We see the Holy Spirit present when Jesus was baptized. Okay, When Jesus was baptized, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all right there in that one moment. And so, so we, see, we, we see evidence of the Spirit of God. But this is that moment when God says, look, I am going to send my Holy Spirit. It is going to dwell in you when you accept the gift that I give to you. When you accept the, the, uh, the, the, the death of the cross and, and, and when, you, when you accept who I am, and when you ask Christ into your heart, you also receive the Holy Spirit. And, and so I want to open the uh, second chapter of Acts this morning to look at that particular moment and, and, and when it began, and then we're going to look to see where God, God steers us in that direction. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost, and there's a whole lot of, here of, of things, that, there's a lot of things here we're going to unpack this morning. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together. In one place. Suddenly, 
a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Jesus had promised the coming of the Spirit. Jesus had explained to them, and he, he, he talked about it while he was with them, but after the resurrection, he told them, look, you just need to wait. And so they did. They were obedient to what he asked them to do. They went back to the same place. They gathered together in a house. They weren't out trying to evangelize. We talked last week about how important the, the events were that they witnessed, but they, they weren't out trying to preach. They weren't out doing those things. They were together. They were together. And then the Spirit came. Now, we could spend... A lot, a lot of time here, right? We can spend a lot of time looking at what this was like, what, 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 what these things are. There's two things here that throughout the Old Testament have always been association, associated with God's presence. Wind and fire. And so I, I think when Luke is writing this, because this is the thing that you have to understand about Luke. Luke, Luke interviewed people. Luke, Luke were, was with people. Luke asked them, what did you experience? And so you think about this. <laughs> Can you imagine being in this room, being in this place when this event happened, and then trying to verbalize that? How do I write down on, on paper? How do I put into words the experience that I've had? And, and so these are the words that, that Luke uses. He, he talks about, it, it didn't say that it was a wind. It was a sound like a blowing wind. And, and, and then they, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. And, and it's like one of those experiences that, that it only happened then, and, and it was just one of those moments that, that God brought this. And, and this was a significant thing for them. It was a significant thing for us. It was a significant thing for the church because now it sets into motion. I don't think it's much about what really took place in that room as the result of what happened. And so we want to look very carefully at the result and what took place uh, that, from that place. When, when, when There's something I want to point out here. <laughs> there's something that you can debate, you know, what this means and what it was like. And, and, but there's one thing, the number one thing that I want to talk about today is that it's the timing. It's the timing. God's timing is always perfect. His timing is always perfect, and, and this event occurred at Pentecost. And, and so it's important to understand what Pentecost is, because when you go back and study the, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection, it occurred at Passover. And Passover was the time that we celebrated, they, they commemorated, they went back and looked to the moment when God passed over their houses in Egypt when the death angel passed over and the firstborn of all of the Egyptians was, was, was died that night. And so they've always pointed back to that moment. And, and, so, and the reason why that death angel passed over those homes was because of the blood. The blood that had to be placed on the door frame of the houses that was taken from the lamb that was slaughtered. A lamb had to die. A lamb had to die, blood had to be poured out, and the blood had to be placed over the door. And so they came to the, day, the, the week that Jesus was crucified, the, the Jews came to Jerusalem. They came to Jerusalem to commemorate that event. And, and even in that, in that moment, in that time frame, they were still slaughtering lambs. They were still sacrificing lambs for sins. They were still sacrificing lambs. And so you go all the way down to the moment that Jesus died on the cross was the exact precise moment that the lambs were slain. And now we're at Pentecost. And penta means five, right? So it's 50, it's 50 days, right? It's 50 days. And so it had been 50 days since the resurrection. And I, and I think that's, it's so important because this is why, we, why I think that, that we really can soak this in is because God is always strategic, okay? When you study the Holy Land, we, we've been doing that some on, in my small group and, and some others on Wednesday night. When you study the positioning, 
You say, why did he pick Jerusalem? It was a land bridge. It was a land bridge between Europe and between Africa, and that's where the population of people were at. And God said, this is where I've put my people, and so this is where I'm going to put my word. This is where I'm going to put the gospel. This is where I'm going to begin the redemptive process. It was strategic. It was strategically placed. It was strategically planned. And so now it's been 50 days since the resurrection, and now we're at Pentecost, and again, people are coming. People are coming back to Jerusalem. God chose to send His Holy Spirit to empower the early church at a time, at a perfect time. At a perfect time when many people would be returning to Jerusalem. We'll talk a little bit about that, but let's look at Acts chapter 2 now, verse 5. This is what's, this is what's happening. Now, there were staying at, in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia. You ever been to any of those places on vacation? Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome. Now you see what happens. You see that just right there when I was talking about that land bridge? Rome's over here. Egypt's down here. You see? They're all coming to this place. They're all coming to this location. And and so they've all gathered there. And and so Luke mentions all of these places where folks had come from. And verse 12 says, Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, What does this mean? What does this mean? In verse 13, (laughs) no matter how amazing God's work is, no matter how much you put into what you feel like God is leading you to do, there are always going to be naysayers. There are always going to be critics. Okay? And here's a perfect example of that in verse 13. Some, however, made fun of them. And said, they've had too much wine. This was the perfect time for God to launch an incredible push of the early church. Because see, here's the thing. Last week we talked about the disciples on the road to Emmaus. As they left Jerusalem, Jesus comes along and he's walking with those disciples. And and he hears them talking about the events that had taken place concerning himself in Jerusalem the previous week. And what does he say to them? What are y'all talking about? And what was their response? (laughs) How do you not know, man? Where have you been? Living under a rock? Right? Where have you been? Where have you been? How how do you not know? So here's my point. It was the talk of the town. It was the talk of the region. This became the talk of the world. When people traveled back and forth, moving from Passover to Pentecost and staying in this area, it's only been 50 days. So word is just spreading about, this is what I've heard. This is what I, I hear. This is what I, I think is going on. This is, have you know? And, and so everybody knows. Everybody, this, this is widespread knowledge. This is widespread knowledge that something is going on. Something, remember, there's been a 400-year period of time where they've heard nothing significant from God. No prophet has risen up. Nothing has been, nothing is happening. And now all of a sudden, there's this stir about this man named Jesus and what has taken place. Listen, God's message has always been very clear. Second point this morning is this. Jesus is the way. And so now at a perfect time, in a perfect place, at a perfect moment, the Holy Spirit comes and empowers people. And now we see a changed man. We see a changed man stand up because, because Peter, just, just a few, just, just, just 50 days before, is hiding and afraid for his life. And now he puts his life on the line. Think about this. This is a, play, this is a guy who was concerned that he would be next. When, when he saw Jesus crucified, and when he saw Jesus, and, and when he saw that happen, in his mind had to be, I'm next. I'm next. And here's the thing that you need to understand. In his mind, he knew that it could still happen. But he did it anyway. 
What I'm about to read, Peter fully understood that this could have meant, this could have been his last address. Think about that. Think about that. Think about that when we have the opportunity to freely witness to people, invite people to church, and, just, and, 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 and all these things. And Peter, Peter, what I'm about to read, Peter did this with full knowledge that this could have been his last statement. This could have been his last address to anyone about anything because he would probably think in his mind, when I get done talking, they're probably going to take me out. And this is what he has to say. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. First of all, he addresses the critics. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. I love this little jab. It's only nine in the morning. We're just a bunch of fishermen, right? No, 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 no. This is what the prophet, this was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he goes into, and now he takes them back to the Old Testament. And this is what he says. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Y'all been talking about that, haven't you? Before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And I love this verse. I love this verse because here's the thing. These guys had every right and, 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 and they could have taken a different turn. They could have said, hey, we recognized him. Hey, we saw him. Hey, he came back to us. We can just go hide and wait until he comes again. And all these terrible people who had him killed, all of these terrible people who criticized, all of these people, they can just go burn. We know. We have the knowledge. But look at this. That's not what God's plan is. And Peter knew it. And he proclaims it. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that awesome? Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles. You've been talking about this for, for years now. Miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But the story doesn't end there, does it? No. No, it doesn't. What does he say? But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is my, at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me in the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with your joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. His tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on, a, on, a, on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. We've been looking for him. We've been looking for him. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead nor his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. You are all here, and everybody knows it. Everybody knows he was here for, for 40 days. We are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see now and what you see and what you hear. This is a result of the Holy Spirit, folks. It's a result of the Holy Spirit. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit. At my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this God has made this Jesus 
whom you crucified, the Messiah. Now, that is very indicting, isn't it? God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Verse 37 really sets in. When we come to realize this, when we come to understand this truth, it'll have the same effect on us as it did on them. It has the same effect today as it did then. And, and, and so when they heard it, when they heard it, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostle, apostles, Brothers, what do we do? What do we do? When they, come to the, the, when they came to the realization, they, they, they heard the word, they heard what Peter was saying, and all of a sudden they realized, <laughs> He's right. He is right. He has quoted to us from the prophet Joel. He has shared us the, the words of, of King David. And we have seen what has taken place around us. And he did. He rose from the dead. And so we, 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 we killed the author of life. We, we killed the author of life. What, what do we do? And here's the greatest thing about this. The answer that Peter gave to them is the same today. Okay, The, P, the, the answer that Peter gave, because, because we stand the same way. We stand in conviction of our sins. We stand unworthy, me included. We all stand unworthy of the presence of God in our lives. And so we find ourselves asking the question, what, what, do, we do? <laughs> what do we do? What do we do? And the answer today to us is the same answer that Peter gave to them. And Peter replied in verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here, you think about this. This is, the, this is such beautiful things. A beautiful mercy here is being poured out because once they realized it, instead of holding on to it, instead of hiding it, they went to the very people, the worst of the world, the ones that they, that they were hiding from, and said, hey, look, you just need to realize what you've done because God's going to provide you grace. God's going to provide you mercy. If you repent and, and are baptized, he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. And, and just like I said, everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This is it, folks. He said, this is it. This is it. But he went on. In verse 40, it says, with, with many other words, he warned them. And he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And look at this revival broke out. 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000. Strategy. God's timing is always perfect. His placement is always perfect. And his message is always the same. We are to repent and be baptized. The glory of this is that forgiveness of sins is still available. Folks, repentance is still necessary. The examination of our conscience, the examination of our soul, the things that we have done, the, 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 the words that we've spoken, the places we've been, any mistake that we've ever made. When, when, when we review that, we come up short. We miss the mark because I'll tell you what God's mark is. It's perfect. It's perfect. The only perfect one that ever lived was Jesus. And they crucified him. And they crucified him. And even for that, he offered for, they offered forgiveness. God offers forgiveness to those who stood there that day. And I'm thankful that he does. I'm thankful that he does. Forgiveness of sins is still available. Repentance is still necessary. The Holy Spirit is God's gift to believers to empower them to do his will. 
Sometimes God asks us to do things, and it's like, I don't know how I'm going to do that. Sometimes I don't know how I do what I do, <laughs> but I do. I'm reminded of that from time to time. When I, when I get to a place and it's like, I don't know how I'm going to do this, I think, well, and then he reminds me, yeah, you can, because I can, and we do, and we just do. God is still active and strategic in his world today. He often uses tragedy to highlight his work and his plan. The greatest tragedy of history was the necessary tragedy of the cross. The necessary tragedy of the cross. It, it was something that perplexed everybody, even Jesus. Because he was fully human, yet fully divine. But yet in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the eve of his crucifixion, said, Is there, a, get, is there, is there another way? Is there another way to not have to do this? God himself had to endure that brutality in order to provide a way for us. It was necessary. It was necessary. Today is the 21st anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Many of you know the moment that you realized that and heard that and where you were standing. I know where I was at. Jordan just shared with me back in the sound room before I walked up here where he was at. He was right on the other side of the wall from me in our classrooms there at, at the high school. And, and, and you watch events like that unfold. And, and, I, and then I'm reminded that none of our students that are in K through 12 now were alive that day. That makes you feel a little old. None of them. God takes tragedy like that. And brings good out of it. Within those moments of, of senseless violence and, 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 and tragic acts, God allows his people to rise up. He allows his people to offer help. He allows his people to offer hope. He allows his people to offer salvation. He allows his people to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do amazing things. And, and from that day and every tragedy that's happened since then, from the flooding in eastern Kentucky to the tornadoes that passed through this county, in the midst of every act of violence or natural disaster, God is present. Amen. God is present and using it for good. For those who love him. Allow him to work in your life. Allow him to work through you. Ask him, what is the strategy here, Father? How, how do you want me to, to approach this? God has always used the darkest days to highlight his story. So how do we respond? What are our walking points? What do we take from the second chapter of Acts? Well, let me start with this. Repent and be baptized. If you have not made that decision, if you've not said yes to the, to, the, to the relationship that he offers, repent and be baptized. It's just as available today as it was on the day of Pentecost. Okay, The Holy Spirit is still present. The Holy Spirit is still, uh, still real. And, and he is still offering forgiveness of our sins. And the, rec the recognition of those sins and the asking of the forgiveness of those sins is all you have to do. That's all that is required of you. And then to be baptized. And then receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be given to you. To those who believe. And that will empower you to be active and sharing the gospel in our world today. God is still being strategic. He is still calling people. He is still placing people. He's placing people all over the world. Our missionaries go all over the world. He's also calling you to your workplace. He's calling you to your neighborhood. He's calling you to the people that are around you, to the people that you encounter. In whatever situation that, that he puts you in, he's called you to be his witness. He's called you to be his witness to those things that you have in, 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 in seen in your own life. Take those opportunities. Don't pass them up. Don't pass them up. But first and foremost, repent and be baptized. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that uh, on the day of Pentecost, you sent a beautiful 
and glorious gift of the Holy Spirit to empower us, to have your presence within us. And Father, as we, as we foster that relationship, as we spend time with you, as we spend time in your word, as we spend time in your prayer and in, in prayer and talking to you, Father, hearing your word and, and, and those are the things that give us a greater of awareness of your presence in our life. It's not something emotional that just comes upon us, Father. It's, it's a relationship. It's a relationship that grows over time. And if we just spend time in your word and spend time talking to you, your awareness and your closeness becomes even more evident in our lives. And, Father, when we have that close walk with you, that spills over into all of those that are around us. So, Father, maybe there's someone here today who's lost. Maybe there's someone here today who's undone. Maybe there's someone here today that just has this burden sitting on their shoulders. And they think their mistakes are too great. That's the biggest lie that Satan tells. Is you've done too much. You've gone too far. No one's out of reach of God. Father, just as Peter said on that day, I say today, repent and be baptized. Lord, if there's someone here that just needs to say, I can't take it anymore. I want to let it go. Father, I, I, my greatest prayer is that they leave this room today forgiven. That they leave this room today understanding that your forgiveness and your mercy is still available. Because, Father, yes, we've all made mistakes. And, yes, there is a punishment required for those mistakes. And, yes, that punishment is death. You took it. You endured it. But it didn't hold you. Death couldn't hold you. <laughs> you rose again from the dead. So, Father, the, the price was paid. The debt was paid in full. But yet you're alive at the right hand of the Father. You, you are there, Father, to receive us, to watch over us, and to guide us, and to one day bring us home to forever dwell with you. Father, help us to accept that promise and that hope for the future. Father, I pray now that however we need to respond in this time of invitation that you'll guide us. The power of the Holy Spirit will begin to reach and pull and tug. And Father, whatever needs to be done, however we need to respond, however we need to reflect, let that be done today. We pray it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.